Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today, we are going to talk about the book Radical Feminism, a documentary reader, edited by Barbara A. Crow, published in the year 2000, and it's going to be discussed by Sheila Jeffries and me, Joe Brew. So um, welcome, everybody, and over to you, Sheila. Oh, and Sheila, you're... Do a little uh, brief introduction talking about uh, what the book's about and what's in it for those of you who don't know it. So it's a very, very useful compendium of papers from radical feminism. There's um, 67 papers in there from um, feminists in the US, and I think it says in the introduction they're mostly on the East Coast, and an, a lot of the papers are from very early on. So they're from 1967. It's wonderful to see stuff from 1967 on to 1973. Um, and those papers uh, are from the women who were building the women's liberation movement in the United States. So that's really exciting. Um, and they, they cover the, in particular, the criticism of the male left by feminists who were in the male left and why women left the male left and set up their own independent women's groups. So reading those pieces, particularly at the beginning of the book, you get a real sense of that movement of women out of the male left and the creation of an, an extraordinary, huge and vital women's liberation movement by those women. And at, at, it, they make it clear in the papers that at the time, the left, which these feminists called the male left, was extremely strong and active um, because it was involved in the Black Rights Campaign, the anti-Vietnam War and so on. So the, the male left was very, very strong, very vital in the 1960s in the US. There was the student movement and so on. And the women who became the radical feminists that this book is about were all involved in the male left. And they brought that experience to creating a new movement. And I think that's one of the ways, and we can talk about other ways in which that time was very different from now when we're trying to create a movement again, is that there is not a strong left. Um, and there are not all kinds of very strong movements that these women were involved in and came out of. So it's, it's forming in a really, really different way this time. So these women brought with them the ideas that um, were important on the male left, such as rejecting hierarchy and rejecting the creation of stars or spokespeople. And they'd seen this happen in the male left, or these things, um, um, and they, uh, they rejected those things. So they came out of a movement and were very critical of that movement. And a lot of their experience was then used in the creation of a new movement. Now, the women were furious that the men on the left wouldn't take women's liberation seriously. And all other kinds of liberation that involved men, such as anti-imperialist movements, anti-apartheid and so on, they took seriously, but not feminism. They were not prepared to give feminists any time at all, or actually take seriously that women could be oppressed, that such a thing could possibly exist. So women were simply expected to serve in these other movements with men. Now, the papers cover the creation of the theory of that movement in these early years, such as defining women as a sex class or a sex caste and defending those kinds of language and so on. And they would do things like asking where men's power comes from and how it should be attacked. And they, they were talking about how women's oppression comes from marriage and through sexuality. And there was criticism of heterosexuality, even that early on, 50, 55 years ago. And they discuss how women's groups should be organized and what they should do. So there were discussions of consciousness raising and how the personal is political. And the women understood themselves as a movement of resistance, like all the other resistance movements happening at the time. And feminists took themselves very seriously in that way. And they used the language and ideas of those struggles. They were very, very, very different times because there are no movements of resistance going on right now. The important themes in the book are race and lesbianism at the time Black women were mainly criticizing black men rather than white women. So that was a little bit different from what's happened since. 
Now, the impression you will get if you read the book, which I hope you will because it's still in print, is of the extraordinary size and strength of the movement. At this time, there were huge numbers of, of newsletters and journals. There were local ones for local cities. There were ones for all kinds of special interests, such as black feminists and lesbians. And there were innumerable conferences. So these papers, and of course, Barbara Crow has made a selection. There were masses more were written for the newspa these newspapers, newsletters and conferences. Now, uh, so it was a time, and I think this is really quite interesting, before the internet or social media, and yet there was an incredibly strong, incredibly powerful movement in which the ideas coming out in this book were coming to the UK, going all over the world. We were certainly in Britain in the, the 1970s using the same language and the same ideas. All of this was happening with no internet, no social media, and the movement was huge and extraordinary compared with the little dribble, which is what a movement is at the moment. Now, another strong impression on reading the book may be how different that time was in other ways, because of course it was a very hopeful time. There were, we believed there would be revolutionary change and that uh, women would have a revolution. We really believed in revolution. We talked about revolution all the time. Lots of the papers talk about revolution and the titles talk about revolution. Nobody, of course, talks about revolution now. Nobody would dream of it. At the time, at this time now, the far right is rising around the world, and it's the opposite of a revolutionary time. And so I think it's important to talk about what kind of women's and lesbian movement can be built in a time like we're in now compared with this earlier one. But we need to look at these early papers and have an idea of what this movement was about in order to inform all our attempts right now to create a women's movement. So uh, can we go on to the first slide, Joe? So I had to make a choice because there's lots of very, very important papers in this book, um, many of which I knew because they came over here to the UK and they were put out in pamphlets. And as I said, they were, they were well known. Now, one of the most famous I have chosen which is the paper by radical lesbians called The Woman Identified Woman, and this is from 1971. And radical lesbian groups were being set up that early. I mean, this is something else that was, of course, extraordinarily important to that previous movement, lesbian feminism. Uh, there's not really anything much like that now. But radical lesbian groups were being set up all over the US. And this is a paper stating their ideas ab about feminism. There was, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of hostility within the movement uh, to lesbians um, from heterosexual feminists who felt that they were dominating and, and so on and so on. So it was important for the, the radical lesbians as the beginnings of, in creating the beginnings of lesbian feminism, to actually do some defining and talk about lesbianism in the women's liberation movement. And so um, they um, came out with this very good, nice, clear definition of lesbianism as a political category. So they say, what is a lesbian? A lesbian is the rage of all women condensed to the point of explosion. She is the woman who, often beginning at an extremely early age, acts in a, a, acceptance, I think it should be of her inner compulsion to be a more complete and freer human being than her society cares to allow her. So that the a lesbian is the rage of all women is a wonderful, wonderful strong statement. So they're saying that it's not simply um, about sexual interest in other women, a lesbian is a form, it, it, she is, in a, in a resistance movement, and lesbianism is a resistance to the oppression of women in, in every way. So the lesbian is a revolutionary who wants to bring down male domination. And she, it, it goes on to say she has been not been able to accept the limitations and oppression laid on her by the most basic role of her society, the female role. Now, so this the definition sees lesbians as precisely those women who refuse to accept women's oppression. 
which is a lovely, strong definition. Uh, it sh I should also say that what happened in the 1980s with the development of what was called the feminist sex wars is that um, some lesbians uh, furiously rejected this feminism and they created, there was a, they created a pornography magazine called On Our Backs. This was in the mid eighties, uh, which it was about sadomasochism and pornography. And On Our Backs was the opposite very deliberately of the wonderful feminist newspaper that went on for so long in the US called Off Our Backs. So the, the pornographers and sadomasochists created something called On Our Backs and on the front cover, they actually used this quote and perverted it to their purposes, which shows just how important it was. They say, a lesbian is the lust of all women condensed to the point of explosion. So they want to turn lesbianism back again into just a, a sexual practice because lesbian feminism is dangerous and it is revolutionary. So it was important for the pornographers and sadomasochists to turn that around. Um, now, I've, I've just put in this a next little quote because we used to talk about male identification quite a lot. So it's quite nice to just sort of look at some of that language. They say, if we are male identified in our heads, we cannot realize our autonomy as human beings. So being male identified, of course, uh, would mean not being able to have a lesbian worldview and not being able to see the world completely from the position of women. Um, and I, we use that language quite a lot, saying so-and-so was very male identified. I don't know that that's language that has survived or that anybody is actually using these days. Um, can we go on to the next slide, Joe? Um, and this, uh, I think, is a useful quote in co in comparison with the, the terrible trouble that I and, and others are having at the moment, making it understood that femininity is a practice of subordination and has to be abandoned. Because there are a lot of women coming into this new movement, if you like, um, against uh, transgenderism who do not understand that femininity is, a, is gender and that it needs to be abandoned, that it is a problem. But in this paper, it says, it is very difficult to realize and accept that being feminine and being a whole person are irreconcilable. Only women can give each other a new sense of self. Although it was very difficult to accept, as they say, back in the 1970s, you would not really have found, certainly not any radical feminists or really feminist spokespersons wearing high heeled shoes and, and looking femmed up. Whereas that is the case now. A lot of women who are coming into this movement see no reason to reject um, effeminate trappings and, and don't have an analysis of why that's a problem. But in 1971, um, it was pretty generally uh, recognized. Now, um, they also say that um, our energies must flow towards our sisters, not backwards towards our oppressors. As long as women's liberation tries to free women without facing the basic heterosexual structure, that binds us in one-to-one -one relationships with our oppressors, tremendous energies will continue to flow into trying to straighten up each particular relationship with a man. How, it should say how here, how to get better sex, how to turn his head around. And there was much discussion of this at the time. And what is wonderful really is in 1971, heterosexuality was being recognized as and being analyzed as the political structure that is the basis of male supremacy, you know, the political structure in which women are controlled, in which their energies are extracted and so on and so on. And, um, can I have that slide back? Um, I can remember uh, back in 1977, when I became a lesbian myself, that this sort of thing was being said to me, Some uh, somebody in the UK, or obviously quite a lot of women, in fact, was saying that um, 
what was the point carrying on being heterosexual because men were the oppressors what was the point of putting your best energies your very best energies your loving energies into the oppressor rather than into, than into the solution and of course lesbians and women were the solution so this kind of language and these kind of ideas were were very very general in the 1970s and this idea that the answer was not to um, change your individual man but we needed a revolution and part of that revolution was simply leaving them was very well understood in the 1970s because otherwise each individual woman has to try and persuade the man there is such a thing as a clitoris and she might like an orgasm she has to persuade him that he should fill the dishwasher and so on she's struggling 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 all the time and she might end up if the man chooses to uh, to allow this to happen uh, with a man who's reasonably well trained after a few years, but that is just one man, and he may go on to another man and choose not to, or another woman and choose not to be so well trained, and so on. Somebody's asking, did lots of women leave their men? Oh yes, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. The women writing these papers will mostly have chosen to have done so rather than have becoming lesbians before the movement, although some will have become lesbians before the movement. So yes, um, obviously changing men one by one is not going to change the class of men. You know, trying to stop him using pornography, trying to do all of the things that women struggle to do with individual men is not going to create a revolution. So um, the other thing that, that they said, which is useful, is it's the primacy of women relating to women, of women creating a new consciousness of and with each other, which is at the heart of women's liberation and the basis for the cultural revolution. We see ourselves as prime, whereas women in relation to men must obviously see the individual men they're with as prime, because otherwise, why would they spend their lives with those people loving them and in the same bed as them and so on? So they would have to see the men as, as prime. Like if you're in heterosexuality, it's very difficult to imagine how that would not be the case. Um, can you do the next slide, Joe? Um, so I'm going to move on now to talk about another paper that I think is um, rather um, terrific. I mean, I had to make choices. And so I've just chosen my two favorites in particular, really. This is the Fourth World Manifesto. And of course, it, it, you can tell from the title that it actually relates to the concerns of the male left at the time and the fact that we believed we were in a revolution, we were putting out manifestos, there were resistance movements happening all over. And women were absolutely seen on the male left as having nothing to do with resistance, with revolution and so on. The only woman I know in the list of those who uh, wrote this, and others may know more women, is Kathleen Barry, of course, uh, who wrote um, The Prostitution of Sexuality, which has been a very, very important feminist, radical feminist theorist throughout. So these, um, these women are, are writing the Fourth World Manifesto, the Fourth World being women, of course, it is women who must rise. The Third World would be the, the colonized countries and the First World is the, is the rich world uh, and so on. So the Fourth World is women. And it's, women, isn't, women are never described in this way. We don't hear people talk about the Fourth World because you know the, the dominant form of feminism is liberalism, you know, you just need a few more women on boards. Revolution, what is that? Whereas in fact, of course, women have to be afraid every time they walk down the streets at night, women may be subject to strangulation in their beds. I mean, what is done to women, the situation in which women live is, is extraordinary. But to talk about us as a fourth world that needs liberation and needs a revolution, that doesn't really happen now. That, that's not really, the way things are said. We only have liberal feminism. So these women who've left the male left and are critical say, we find it self-evident that women are a colonized group who have never anywhere been allowed self-determination. And of course that is true. I mean, to one extent or another, um, I mean, in some countries, of course, women are not allowed out without men, must be covered, and so on. But in all countries in the world, women suffer very, very serious uh, restrictions, like not being able to walk safely down the street. Therefore, all women who fight against their own oppression, colonized status, 
um, as, fem uh, uh, as females under male domination are anti-imperialist by definition. Although, of course, the men on the male left could not understand that. How could women be anti-imperialist? Because there is no imperialism over women. And it should be, I, I should mention, of course, that my, my last book was called Penile Imperialism. So I have always used the concept of imperialism and always will do that. Um, so uh, they say, we have worked out a deeper analysis of the emotional, psychological and social assumptions underlying the attitude that women's liberation is less important than black liberation, anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, etc. And of course that is still true. I mean, if we just think about the hate crime legislation that's been passed in Scotland, women aren't even in there. They're not going to have sex biological sex and women in their hate crime legislation, although they do say, you know, wait girls, wait girls, at some point in the future, a few years time, we may do that. Um, so women's liberation and the oppression of women is hugely, hugely less important, barely important at all on the political record. Right, so it, I think that possibly um, Sheila, she. So I'll I'll carry on. <laughs> I'll carry on. Just carry on <laughs> where Sheila is. I guess she'll come back on. It looks. It. it Marion, do you think that's right that Sheila's um, cut off? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know where yeah. she went. Okay, so I'll keep on going on this. This. Um, uh, this fourth world manifesto. Um, uh, well, I'll say what I was going to say about it. Is. Um, I think it should be given to every single woman who ever thinks they're going to work in a um so Sheila, just you're connecting on, I'll just I'll just carry on the little bits. So Sheila, I'm just picking up and saying what I was going to say on the Fourth World Manifesto. So I think it should be given as an article to any woman who is thinking of joining a left-wing organization or a trade union political organization a bit like a, a you know a statement of harm that might come to you like this is a side effect and th this is actually what's going on so if if i think any many of us have spent time in in left-wing organizations if we had read this if this had been given to everybody because this it, 1973 it says it all it says exactly what the problems are of the left and i think it was inoculate women from joining these left organizations because it's so clear anyway back to you sheila and we can't see the whole of you i think you're if you could move okay. your yes Can that's I? it perfect okay yeah. back back to you okay so um what, what they're saying is that they have they they've worked out why it is that men say the ridiculous things they say when they're trying to put down women in left organizations and prove to them that they're less significant and so on uh, all of this i think is that uh, pretty relevant now that we've got lots of lefty men trying to pretend that men can become women and women are less important than the men who wear the dresses. So um, they they say, is there any analysis against about imperialism against women? Is there any recognition in writing or action that women are a colonized group, brutally exploited by their colonizers men, and this is a primary factor of women's existence? No. The male left has absolutely no interest in a female revolution. And that's right. You know, women are murdered in their beds on the street, constantly harassed. And the male left have absolutely no interest and uh, no consideration whatsoever that women need a revolution. So they say they're talking about the way that men on the male left would respond to them. The first tactic in reaction to women's liberation was laughter. The next tactic was anger, saying, you castrating bitches. And of course, there's a lot of men very, very angry with women at the moment for thinking they have a, a right whatsoever to even think that they are of any significance. Then the men really began to get nervous. They say, after all, women were leaving the left in increasing numbers. And of course, that was happening in the late 60s. They were losing their constituencies, the women who made the tea, who supported them, who made the banners, who were always there. The women were leaving. And the men began to play guilt games. So what makes you think you're oppressed, you white middle class chick? And in the paper, they go through all of this, what, what they mean when they say white, what they mean when they say middle class, what they mean when they say chick, and so on. And of course, I'm sure extremely similar things are still said. Can we have the next page, Joe? OK, one of the things that I find interesting in the paper is they talk about female culture because um, the anti-imperialists recognize that the imperialists destroy the culture 
of the groups that they want to um, control, and that's very, very important in controlling them. And one of the philosophers at the time in the 1960s, the um, black philosopher and professor Franz Fanon, who mostly wrote about the revolutionary struggle in Algeria in North Africa, particularly talked about the importance of culture and the way that the culture of the oppressed peoples of North Africa was suppressed. And they say, uh, Fanon shows that it's not enough for the, uh, for the colonizer to control the territory and subject the inhabitants of it to his rule. The colonizer must destroy the culture and self-respect of the colonized. Now, I don't necessarily agree with everything they say about culture here, and I don't have time to go into it in detail because of course, there's the culture of the oppressed that they create in order to survive the oppression. There's the culture of the oppressed that the colonizer places on them. I think what's happening now, interestingly, is that the men who pretend to be women are trying to destroy all the elements of culture that women have created, such as, um, you know, safe spaces that women can go to, um, safe women's spaces, um, they're, they're intruding on women's art, literature, uh, they're, they're, they're really doing a fairly thorough job of trying to destroy any possibility of culture of women at this moment. And so I think that the whole issue of what is women's culture uh, and of course, we created a huge culture as a movement, a huge culture, we created a literature, a theater, a music. All of that has pretty much been suppressed and eliminated. And so what the men in dresses are doing now, I think, is clearing up. They're getting rid of women's toilets and so on. So they're kind of making sure that no elements that could be seen to be a women's culture can exist. And the last thing I want to talk about is there are several very important pieces on um, black feminism and the creation of black feminism because black feminism was being created at the same time as uh, lesbian feminism and so on. And so I just thought I'd just give an example from one. This is Frances Beale's Double Jeopardy to be Black and Female. She says, unfortunately, there seems to be some confusion in the movement today as to who has been oppressing whom. Since the advent of black power, the black male has exerted a more prominent role in our struggle for justice in this country. When it comes to women, he seems to take his guidelines from the pages of the Ladies' Home Journal. So the, the, the male left, uh, the black male left was the black power movement at the time in which many uh, black feminists wrote, particularly Michelle Wallace, for, for, her, for instance, in her wonderful 1979 book, Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman. But there was a lot of criticism of the se uh, sexual role, the sexual position of woman being prone and so on that the black power leaders were talking about. Um, and so women were furious about that as they came out into a feminist movement. Uh, they said certain black men are maintaining that they have been castrated by society but that black women somehow escaped this persecution and even contributed to this emasculation. The black woman in America can justly be seen as the slave of a slave. And in fact, Michelle uh, Wallace talks about that in her Myth of the Superwoman paper, which is half of her book, um, that black women are seen as castrating black men. Black women are the problem, not oppressed, not even doubly oppressed, but actually the problem for black men. Um, so, okay, I think that's all that I'm going to talk about in the, uh, relation to those papers for the moment. Over to you, Jo. Right, so um, I would just say, before we move on to the the next article, um, it, this, uh, this, the Fourth World Manifesto, um, is, is definitely worth reading. Everybody should read it, in my mind. I think that one of the, um, uh, things that comes out is that it's very important for uh, patriarchy and all the institutions which they outline in the Fourth World Manifesto to make sure that we do not have a class consciousness and we do not know this. So a lot of time is spent creating divisions between women and they're the, the, so, um, but those are then hidden and covered up by the non-teaching of articles like this. And in my mind, it's, I mean, we, we've talked about this before, it's a sort of a paid job. You get a position in, a professional position in patriarchy for doing the work of 
uh, getting rid of class consciousness or caste consciousness by women. So schools do it by talking about uh, sort of left wing movements, but n not talking about uh, women as a class. Academia absolutely does it. So this is a very short time and we had women's studies departments and then we've got this gender studies. So they never they would never teach this yes, the fourth, fourth world manifesto it's part of our heritage it's a development it's a sort of key text for women if we want to uh be liberated is that we should all have read this and then the media of course so um it, it makes me very angry when i was reading this that we have have not got this as part of every mother or every woman teaches young people to read this and it's just been covered up and it's it, it, it's it's never shared and luckily we've got I mean I think the only place that we're sharing this is on our Radfem perspectives it's it's just infuriating that we can't get the message out more okay so um and then just I suppose going back back to Sheila, you were saying that we are now having this, they're trying to clear up with the transgenderism, they're trying to clear up the women's spaces. I think that's absolutely true. But one thing that's a good thing about the transgenderism is in a way by attacking all women, they're attacking the feminists, radical feminists in particular as the political voice or a very strong political wing for women, but they're attacking all women and it is recreating a caste consciousness or a class consciousness of women, all the women who are being attacked, like we saw yesterday in Edinburgh. There were loads and loads of women out on the streets. There were loads and loads of people understanding that we're being attacked as a caste stroke class, which is uh, uh, in our favour. So at least we've got that. Um, OK, so we're moving now on to the next um, uh, article that this is one I picked from the book. So Radical Feminism by T. Grace Atkinson. Now, this was written in May 1969, and it's a very theoretical piece uh, about what is radical feminism? What is a feminist political theory which would work? And she she it's, it's brilliant because it's quite raw in a way. She is just thinking through um, where they are in 1969, what she's thinking, what the women's movements have done. And she talks at one stage and saying, we've been going for three years and we haven't got a proper theory yet. We haven't got a political theory, so I'm going to write something down. And then she writes down, it's a sort of state of play of where they were, but of her thinking. But before we go, or I go into more of her article, going to bring in Sheila and Marion to talk about T. Grace Atkinson and what we know about her, which for me isn't very much. But so if I'm going to stop sharing and get everybody on screen um, and get so. Um, so Sheila, maybe first, what um, yeah. who was T. Grace? I don't, as far as I you don't think I, I don't think I'm very qualified to say this. I think Marion is much more qualified. I mean, all I've done, really, I mean, I wasn't in the States and I never knew her. All I did was read Amazon Odyssey which I do recommend to everyone, which is a very, very brilliant book. But af apart from that, I don't think I've got very much information. I think Marion's much better suited to talk about this. Um, Tigris Atkinson is still, she wrote a paper um, in uh, 2014 um, and uh, at a conference done at uh, Boston University um, on a panel called How to Defang a Movement, Replacing the Pol political with the personal. It was a, a conference on uh, women's liberation in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, you couldn't have this conference now, uh, but you could back in 2014. And, you know, 50 years after that that quote that was just on there, um, she, she still, you know, um, maintains the core that she was one of the founders of, the you know, the radical feminist analysis that it was the core of the entire women's liberation movement. Um, and here it is, 2014, and she's um, she's uh, saying the, the one assumption that no one questioned. There were lots of different movements. There were lots of different, you know, um, different groups, and they all had um, some specific ideas. But the one assumption that no one questioned, she says, was that women formed a class and that this class was an artificial one designed for political purposes to oppress women. 
we called this artificial class gender. Our mantra was Bovier's dictum, one is not born, but rather becomes a, a woman. And later in the in her talk, um, she uh, mentions a casual conversation with Simone de Bovier in, in 1975, um, who warned her uh, to watch out for the anti-feminist differentialists. And what she was talking about were, were postmodernists. And in 2014, T. Grace Atkinson, like she did 50 years ago, and like we're we're you know talking about now, um, talked about language and talked about women as a class and how language and how um, uh, the genderists um, have have used language. She says she finally understood um, by the late 1980s what Bouvier was talking about postmodernism and therefore queer theory and the entire gender ideology, really. Um, postmodernism um, is a profoundly reactionary political theory. Postmodernism pretends to focus on words and on words about words, which it calls discourse. Postmodernism pretends to analyze discourse through something called deconstruction, but instead words are used to mystify and confuse and finally to prevent any meaningful steps forward, especially as regards thinking about the world. Words are not facts. It is facts which deny all women our humanity, and it is facts which we must change. Women are a political class. The first one, the first one, the first political class which has produced the paradigm paradigm for other class systems, a sequential bifurcation of the human species, a bifurcation which is repeated one atop another until every individual is pitted against every other, uh, which I think is part of why um, women are never allowed to just seek their own liberation that that our movement is supposed to um is supposed to include and take in all others and we're supposed to be fighting for people who may be a, against our against our interests but um the thing to know about t grace atkinson the only book you know her only book is amazon odyssey she um she uh i don't i i think i you know saw her speak a lot of times and she was really really brilliant her mind just was like a mile a minute um i don't know that she liked writing very much um, but she, but she was brilliant. Um, and if you read her books, she she was saying the same thing 50 years ago um, that she's saying now because she she invented it. She created created it, and she understood better than a lot of other people back then um, that you know the difference between the personal and political. And everything we were trying to do as radical feminists was essentially essentially political. Um, I got to hear her speak a few times. I followed her around like a puppy. <laughs> um, and got, you know, got to ask her some questions. And um, if you can get a hold of that book, it's fantastic. But know that she, um, 50 years later, um, you know, great paper. Um, she, she still it was trying to say, look, this is this is radical feminist analysis. We're a class. We're oppressed as a class. It's not it's not personal. It's not that, you know, it, it's not um, that we want you to to leave your um, your Nigel. It, it's that is that politically it matters whether how how all women um, relate or don't relate to their Nigels. Brilliant. OK, I'm going to go. That's fantastic. And uh, so we've got a bit of an introduction. I'm going to go uh, back to sharing screen and uh, go on to the uh, the article. Um, so, yeah, great. We've got it. So uh, it's 1969 and T. Grace Atkinson says this women have tried to solve their problems as a class uh, who have tried to solve their problems as a class have proposed not solutions but dilemmas the traditional feminists want equal rights for women with men but what on, on what grounds if women serve a different function from men in society wouldn't this necessarily affect women's rights for example do all women have the right not to bear children Traditional feminism is caught in the dilemma of demanding equal treatment for unequal functions because it is unwilling to challenge the political or functional classification by sex. Radical women, on the other hand, grasp that women as a group somehow fit into a political analysis of society, but err in refusing to explore the significance of the fact that women form a class. The uniqueness of this class and the implications of this description to the system of political classes. Both traditional feminists and radical women have evaded questioning any part of their raison d'etre, I guess. A woman, women are a class and the terms that make up that initial assumption must be examined. So it's great 
1969 she's writing this um and you can you, you, it's just enjoyable seeing her thinking seeing how she's developing these ideas so she then goes on to say the feminist dilemma is that it is as women or females that women are persecuted just as slaves or or blacks that slaves were persecuted it was as slaves or blacks that slaves were persecuted in america in order to improve their condition those individuals who are today defined as women must eradicate their own definition women must in a sense commit suicide and the journey from womanhood to a society of individuals is hazardous the feminist dilemma is that we have to the most to do and the least to do it with. We must create, as no other group in history has been forced to do so from the very beginning. So she's grappling there in 1969 with some of the key issues that we're dealing with now, that we've been defined as women or females, and it's very difficult to unpick who we really are because of the widespread, you know, the, this position of being the oppressed and the brainwashing to be that. And then she's saying, in order to improve our condition, we in a way have to add, we have to eradicate our own definition. And then on top of that, we're getting all the transgender, the gender um, defining of women, that we're meant to define ourselves by gender. And I think it's very interesting. I mean, she writes really nicely and interestingly, it's very potent in terms of our own thinking, saying we must, in a sense, commit suicide. The journey from womanhood to a society of individuals is hazardous. And so much writing that's come after that or did come after that, uh, like uh, Carol Pateman's um, The Sexual Contract, um, you can see you can see it coming from. I mean, I suppose the same themes are there as how do we become individuals and what does that mean and how do we negotiate being an individual in a patriarchal society when we're not men what what goes on there right so next slide she says as women begin massing together they take the first step from being massacred to engaging in the battle resistance and hopefully eventually to negotiations in the very far future and peace when any person or group of persons or a group of persons being mistreated or to continue our metaphor is being attacked there's a succession of responses depending on the severity of the attack short of an attack on life the victim determines how much damage was done what is and what is done what it was done with where's the attack coming from from whom what located where how can you win the immediate battle defensive measures holding actions why did he attack you how can you win end the war offensive measures and she's saying these are necessary um and they haven't been answered by the women's movement and then she says and for this reason i think one cannot properly call that movement political it could not have any direction relevant to women as a class so she's very much saying there's a battle of the sexes she which she talks about and um we need to take it seriously and think about what's actually happening and how are we going to win that or defend ourselves and possibly and win hopefully it's very similar to so uh emmeline pankhurst's my life the struggle is my life um who takes this same sort of uh, almost military attitude of there's a war on on us how are we going to win it what are we going to do what actually can work so then next next little bit from this uh interesting article she wrote i believe that the sex roles of both male and female must be destroyed not the individuals who happen to possess either a penis or a vagina or both or neither but many men i've spoken with see little to choose between the two positions and feel without the role they'd just as soon die so it's the role of oppressor they would they they see it uh, they want I mean it's more important to have their sex role than anything else and then she says certainly it is the master who resists the abolition of slavery especially when he is offered no recompense in power I think that the need men have for the role of oppressor is the source and foundation of all human oppression they suffer and this is she's going into some 
interesting speculation or theory here. She says they suffer from a particular a disease pe peculiar to mankind, which I call metaphysical cannibalism. And men must, at the very least, cooperate in curing themselves. Um, she um, and then yeah, go on. Marion, do come in. There was a question um uh in the chat about a sustainable feminist consciousness. And this quote actually addresses it. She said something once, and I don't know if she wrote it or I just heard her um, say it, that um, what we call male socialization, it's like, how do we end it? We, can we educate men? Um, why should it end? Men get this. They get, they're very political about it. Um, the, a political system, um, they get what they want. Why should men want to, to teach their sons differently? Why should men teach their, their fellow men differently? Why should they? they get what they want out of male, what we call male socialization and gender roles. They want from women, they want sexual services and emotional labor. And it all kind of, everything can be really um, put into those. And um, so I remember her saying, it's like, why should, why should they, um, you know, why should they want to end it? They get what they want out of it. And they, it's political for them. It's completely political for women. It's like, it's flipped. Um, but if I, you know, that if I embrace this um, political system um, and rebel against it and, and you know, you hear the phrase abandon men or or just, you know, um, you know, be separatist, um, <clears throat> women still want personal things out of it. <clears throat> and, you know, we it's not sustainable for women um, because many women still want personal things out of it instead of, um, you know, changing our status as a as a political class. Um, she, um, T. Grace Atkinson was very, very separatist. She was heterosexual. She was very separatist. Um, I had a friend who, uh, <clears throat> who studied with her in a PhD program in philosophy in, at Columbia University. And they had some, apparently a few great conversations, but T. Grace said, but we can't be friends because she just didn't have any male friends at all by, by choice. I mean, it was a political choice. So and that's, I think that addresses part of why, um, fem, you know, feminist, um, sustainability um is is so difficult to come by but from for men you know it's sustain it's sustaining um male socialization that's easy they get what they want why should they change it yeah absolutely okay right i'm going to go on to the next slide which and then we've only got two more slides so uh, this this essay is really interesting so it's definitely worth reading because it sort of makes us think about what's going on today and she's she uses slightly different language to the language we i normally come across um so she says men neatly decimated decimated mankind by one half when they took advantage of the social disability of those men now these are women they're the the individuals who bore the burden of reproductive process so she's talking about the creation of the class the and the of, of the oppressed which is us Men invaded the being of those individuals now defined as functions, so to be things to do, we're, we're functional doers, uh, or females, appropriated their human characteristics and occupied their bodies. The original rape was political, the robbing of one half of mankind of its humanity, so she's saying well, of individuals. The sexual connotations to the term no doubt grew out of the characterization characterizations made later of the men in the original action. This rape in its essential features has been reenacted and rationalized and justified ever since. So she's saying this political rape of women um, is linked up to the physical, making us into breeders, functions, but it's been reenacted uh, ever since. Firstly, those men called women have been anchored to their position as victim by men devising numerous direct variations on women's capture, consolidating women's imprisonment. Secondly, men have devised indirect variations on the original crime via the principle of oppression against other men. But all these variations, what we call class systems and their supportive institutions are motivated by man's nature and all political change will result in nothing but other variations on metaphysical cannibalism, rape, until we find a humane, human and equitable alternative. 
And then she says the male female distinction was the beginning of the role system, wherein some persons function for others. And the primary distinction should properly be referred to as the oppressor, male, oppressed female distinction, the first political distinction. We were the first polit political class in the beginning of the class system. Then the final slide. Um, again, I mean, there's some really interesting, so in this final bit, there's some interesting ideas. Uh, the combination of his power, her self-hatred, and the hope of a life that is self-justified the goal of all living creatures results in a yearning for her so stolen life, herself. That is the delusion and poignancy of love. Um, I mean, in this bit where she's saying uh, uh, th th that it's quite before Mary Daly or sort of um, some of this, you can sort of see some of the ideas that Mary Daly writes. And it's interesting that this was 1969. And love is the natural response of the victim to the rapist. What's extremely difficult and unnatural but necessary is for the oppressed to cure themselves, destroy the female role, uh, destroy feminine gender as we're trying to do, to throw off the oppressor and to help the oppressor cure himself to destroy the male role. It's superhuman, but the only alternative, the elimination of males as a biological group, is subhuman. Politics and political theory revolve around this paradigm of the oppressor and the oppressed. The theory and practices can be divided into two parts, those institutions which directly reinforce the paradigm case of oppression and those which reinforce the principle later extrapolated from this model. And we're seeing that now that pretty much all the institutions in society, all the professions are directly reinforcing the paradigm of patriarchal oppression against women. And most of the people involved in our struggle against gender, transgender identity ideology are befuddled by the whole of this. They're surprised and don't understand what's going on. Our beloved National Health Service, our lovely teaching profession, our media or our BBC, they don't get it because they don't see that those professions are reinforcing the principle and the trade unions, as we know. Then just the last thing, she's got, there's a nice little quote here. Feminism is the theory, lesbianism is the practice. And then one point um, here is that in 2013, Atkinson, along with Carol Hanish, Kathy Scarborough, Kathy Sarah Child, initiated forbidden discourse, the silencing of feminist criticism of gender, which they described as an open statement from 48 radical feminists from seven countries. And that was basically a statement. Uh, it's quite a short statement of about two pages and um, which uh, talks about the theoretical problems, the, the, the attack by transgender ideology on women's rights. And they don't use the term women's sex based rights. But um, I think we should definitely get that and share it widely. Um, I've got a copy of it somewhere, I just can't find it. Um, but that uh, had these 48 radical feminists. And when we were creating the Declaration on Women's Sex Based Rights, which I must say my role was mostly buying chocolate and making people, making Sheila and Maureen turn up and Heather. Um, or persuading them to, we had that, somebody sent us that and said, this is an important uh, precursor, but it was, you know, it's quite limited in what they said, but very good, very brilliant statement. Okay, so let's get Sheila and Marion back on to just discuss the last couple of minutes. Oh, there I am off mute. Um, Yeah, yeah um, I think we've kind of covered it all. Um, T. Grace Atkinson, really seminal, one of the women who created radical feminist analysis. Um, and I, you know, I want to reiterate again, um, women embracing the personal over the political. Um, you know, we, we tell men who say, I, you know, I have to, you know, incels, we tell them I have to have sex. I can't live without it. I need to have sex, you know, and we tell them, no, you, you, you won't die. Um, you can live without sex. You won't die. Um, and and we don't want to be told that you can live without sex um, because we're good people. Um, we're good people and we deserve sex and we deserve intimacy and we deserve all the good things that come along with it. Um, uh, 
in in our in our um, status as a politically oppressed class, um, trying to you know trying to um, for women who want to uh, find that kind of intimacy and and find um, you know a, a life with the oppressor, um, it is it is it that's a personal choice. That's not a political choice. And women may say, why should I make that political choice? I want to be personally happy. Um, I don't, you know, one of the things T. Grace Atkin was, Atkinson was saying, and one of the things that, that was really um, fundamental to um, the concept of us as an oppressed class is that it is um, a priori, axiomatic, that an oppressor, a slave, cannot be happy in a pers personal relationship, um, sexual intimate relationship with her oppressor. Um, and and the fact and and that you can live without sex and it has nothing to do with whether or not you deserve sex or not or whether you deserve a relationship or not incels you know probably don't deserve it and 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 women do um but it's gotten whether or not you can live with it um and be happy without it has nothing to do with whether you deserve it or not um i i you know i am very very wary um especially as a lesbian of telling telling straight women that that um you're you're kind of you know i don't want to say doomed but that it's it's very very hard to find what what women want interpersonally um because of um our political status and that i'm gonna was, i'm gonna butt in now because we haven't yeah we haven't got long i just want to yeah. see what marion uh sheila's gonna say for yeah last, so gonna got a few minutes yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, what I've been thinking is, I mean, all, all of the papers that we're talking about really are saying that women are a, a sex class, women are a caste, women are the fourth world, and the oppression of women is huge, real, and needs to be recognised, but men don't recognise it at all, and they still don't, and there's still absolutely no recognition of the size, the immensity of, of the oppression of women. I think that what's different of, about the oppression of women compared with the oppression of all different groups of men, which is recognised, because they're human beings and they're recognized, is that it's seen as natural. It is actually seen as nature. And it's so clear that this is seen as nature because as I mentioned during this seminar, webinar, there are still many feminists themselves who, who consider themselves feminists, who actually think that high heeled shoes, long hair, makeup, all those sorts of things are somehow good, fine, not political, and so on. They're seen as natural. So even the vast majority of women themselves have accepted that the oppression of women uh, mark, being marked out as a sex class for oppression is natural. And th there's no other way to explain why it cannot be seen. The oppression of women cannot be seen. It is nature yeah. and it cannot be seen. And I, I would add to that a choice because uh, there's there's a, such a, a strong uh, connection. People say, I choose. I, it's nothing to do with oppression. I just choose my gender, gendered performance of femininity. And... I think that that's it. So we've got the people like the right wing, the conservatives and people saying it's nature or God. So it could be nature, God. But then the liberals and the left are saying left wing women are saying it's my choice. It's my choice. And that's uh, just as bad. It's just as unhelpful because um, it's it's choosing your oppression or choosing our oppression. Right, we're all really <laughs> we're very upset about this <laughs> well let's call it a day then um next week we've got uh the transsexual empire by janice raymond it's going to be discussed by leah keith and marion rotiliano um what is uh so fantastic and uh, just unbelievable is that every time we think what are we going to do next we find another treasure trove of um feminist writing, radical feminist writing. And this this book, if anybody can get it, Radical Feminism, I can't show it to you, but the, <laughs> there we are. Well, anyway, it's called Radical Feminism, a documentary reader by Barbara A. Crow. is unbelievable. It's really thick. There's loads in there. It's highly recommended. And it's not it's not just rehashing old things. There's lots of really vibrant, interesting, creative, potent writing in there that will make you think afresh about life and about now. So it will help our struggle. The more we understand about it, um, the, the better we're going to understand what to do now. 
Right. Well, thank you so much, Sheila and Marion. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And either see you in the breakout rooms or see you next week or soon. Okay. Bye.